Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Dr. Music Podcast once again, where I have Mr. Jack Hughes, a return guest. Always great to have Jack on the show. Uh, Jack is a founding member of New Wave Pioneers Wang Chung, acting as the band's singer and guitarist for more than 40 years uh, with longtime partner Nick Feldman. Wang Chung has sold millions of records around the world with great chart success. Uh, songs like Everybody Have Fun Tonight and Dance All Days, songs we'll never forget in the fabric of, of life as we know it. Uh, Jack has also done solo work away from Wang Chung, and he has a brand new single, and it's called two, Since 2017. And it is an interesting song, Jack, and it's an interesting <laughs> video. Uh, it's a departure from what we know uh, in Wang Chung. Uh, let's let's talk about Since 2017. Um, sure. What's the inspiration behind that song? Um, well, it's really a song about the UFO slash UAP phenomena. Um, uh, something I've been interested in since the mid nineties, really. Um, <clears throat> just met some people who are interested in alternative ideas, and um, and of course, initially when you come across that subject, you sort of think, "Wow, God, this is all." crazy you know <clears throat> but as you start to read into the subject and, and there are some very good books you know which which contain testimony from expert witnesses you know certainly stuff that would stand up in a court of law you know um mm -hmm. uh, it's uh it, you start sort of saying ah, well maybe there is something to it you know and then as you get into it you get to the wilder fringes of it you know right. <clears throat> all of that is also very interesting you know but where i stand with it is it, just curiosity i think you know and uh and it certainly makes the days a bit more interesting, you know, when you're reading about what these craft and entities may or may not be, you know. Um, but particularly since 2017, uh, there was an article in the New York Times, uh, which is essentially the New York Times, as it were, legitimizes the consensus reality, you know. Uh, and, it, and it was basically saying that the Pentagon says that the I, you know, UFOs of they as they, the things they've observed are definitely real. The question is, what are they? You know, and that does make the the whole debate about the subject very different from, oh, they it's probably just uh, some somebody else's tech or you know military tech or whatever. You know, and um, right. so that was a sort of game changing. So hence the song title. Since two thousand seventeen, everything has changed. You know, and I guess it's my sense that we live in this world that we live in. Like you say, you talk about everybody have fun tonight and dance all days. You you put it really well. You know, that constitute the fabric of the life as we know it. <laughs> you know. Really? <clears throat> but I think there's another life, there's a whole other sort of reality behind that, you know, and uh, um, and, and the UAP thing is a very interesting lens, in a sense, to sort of view how um, you know, information is controlled, you know, and, and the song is kind of about that. The song is a sort of what if they're real, what happens then, you know, think, think about the ramifications, you know, of it all. And uh and I guess, um, you know, at the beginning of this year, I, I I got a whole new new load of song ideas. You know, when when you're writing, I, I go through phases of being quite sort of fertile <laughs> uh, in, in terms yeah. of song ideas. And I got a whole load of ideas early this year. And one of them was this sort of arpeggio idea in a strange key. You know, guitar players, they play in sharp keys, but, you know, E major, A major, G they're all good keys for guitar because you can use the open strings. But when you start going flat, you can't use your open strings so much. But I came up with this little lick in, in sort of E flat, which is not guitar key. And I I thought about this later, actually. I didn't think about it at the time, but but that's quite a sort of alien key. <laughs> yeah, you know? there you go. <laughs> and this song kind of evolved in this sort of strange sort of twilight world, you know, uh, uh, um, you know, different keys and stuff, you know, and uh, yeah, and then the lyrics evolved as well. And, um, you know, I tried to sort of reference as much as I could uh, in, in the subject to try and kind of get people interested in it, you know, and I guess I wanted to put it out right now because of the congressional hearings that happened about a month ago now. Right. And uh, and it seems like a hot topic and, and uh, as much attention as can be drawn to it and as much open mindedness as can be encouraged. Uh, you know, I, I'm a fan of that. Yeah, yeah, and that's it is it has changed uh, since that article. Uh, Leslie yeah. Dean, of course, um, an outspoken proponent of that, um, and 
you know, the, there's so many references in here. You you reference Leslie Keene, James Fox. Uh, you reference, uh, reference uh, Tom DeLonge, uh, yeah. which was an odd reference for me. Uh, of course, the Blink-182 singer uh, yeah. claiming that he didn't sleep for three days uh, yeah. because he knew something. Uh, yeah. Really great references in here. Uh, one of them I really want to ask you about um, is... In the end, they've come to take the matches from the child. It's a big portion of the end of the song. Uh, yeah. <laughs> where does that come from, and what are we referring to? Is that nuclear weapons, the matches? Yeah, yeah. It's an interview with a, a guy called Robert Salas. Um, I forget what rank he is, but he was a, you know, like a military, you know, high-ranking military uh, in charge of nuclear weapons. Uh, uh, I forget. I think it's Maelstrom. Air Force Base. I'm not very good with the, with the precise references, but anyway, Robert Salas uh, went on record uh, in in the sort of initial disclosure hearings, which were took place around early 2000s, I think, uh, and talked about his experience of uh, a UFO, you know, that was observed by people on the ground hovering above this nuclear missile site that was live, as it were, and how the the, the UFO, well, well, it was there. It was presumably responsible for the fact that the, all of the nukes were shut down. They had ten sort of things, and uh, he said they, he watched them all go offline, sort of one after the other. <laughs> wow. you know? uh, and so, when people, you know, one of the big uh, uh, sort of thrusts at the moment in Congress, I think, is to try and see the UAP issue as a security issue. You know, right. and I think when that sort of thing happens, that is that's a security issue. You know. Right. Um, but his his attitude to it, I I really respect and love really. You know, in that he's very philosophical about it, and and in uh, you know he he says I got the distinct impression that they were here to take the matches from the child. Yeah. You know, and it was just kind of like you know we know we're much bigger than you are. We have got <laughs> much, you know we you don't know what you're doing with all this stuff. Do you know what I mean? Right. Uh, we can take it off you. Do you know what I mean? But you know, really, you've got to learn for yourselves. You know, when when you get into these sort of philosophical things that you know the, the, uh, this non-human intelligence is trying to interact with us and trying to sort of raise us to a better spiritual level if you like i think that turns a lot of people off as, as an idea it's like but you know again this this whole subject the reason it interests me is because there are so many levels to it and one of those levels is is the idea that we could be better <laughs> the human race could right. behave <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we I definitely get that feeling. Uh, <laughs> we are doing our best uh, in most times, it seems. Uh, that is, a, it's a great... Uh, be, being a Beatles fan, do you know what I mean? You know, and, and all you need is love and all those sort of mm -hmm. discredited ideas <laughs> as they seem now, you know. But, yeah. I, oh, but, you know, still, really, it's the only way to go, you know. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It's all, it's what we all want, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know, exactly. just want to love each other and be happy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this is a, a, a really great song for opening up conversation about this and, and philosophical yeah. discussion about everything, uh, not yeah. only the UFOs, but life in general, I think. Uh, mm. Just great. Uh, one more question about that, the video. Um, it's it's odd. Uh, <laughs> it, it's just one seems like a slide or a, a, a what is the image that we're looking at in the video? The image is one of the images released by the Pentagon uh, of uh, an, an object. I, th I think that's called the gimbal, <laughs> that one, you know. Yeah. So it was captured on radar. It was captured on a number of different media, as it were, uh, on the ground and by pilots in the air, you know. And um, there's been a lot of debate about it. You know, there are people who are extremely sceptical and, and think that it's some sort of just anomalous image that's sort of like, occurred inside the camera as it were you know but but i think there were pilots who saw it with their naked eye as well again you need to check up on all the real facts of this you know but it's just a sort of iconic image from that time and essentially uh me and uh joel uh joel mcgill who helps me with all the releases um uh joel is a member of the band sid arthur who are a great sort of canterbury band a rock band you know and anyway, he put it through this sort of filter. So it just kind of explores the image. And, and what it does to it is quite interesting. I think it sort of uh, it gives it lifelike quality. <laughs> it, it is. It's really yeah. interesting. And and it's, you know, it's slowly moving in and out. And yeah. 
know, there is it's a very Pink Floydish thing, if you will. Uh, it, it it's great. It fits the music very well. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, so it, it it's it's a pleasure. Um, is the song part of a set of more songs? Perhaps an it, upcoming record. It is <laughs> okay. Burst of uh, of ideas. So I, I probably got about two thirds of an album written at the moment. You know, and I, I just wanted to get this song out there. You know, as I say, it's uh, it's topical. It would seem to be a shame to be leaving it till maybe next year to release it when all these uh, when this subject is so much debated. You know, yeah. Uh, my next, my third solo album effectively uh uh I, I like trilogies you know so uh yep. <laughs> it will be nice so i'm hoping that uh you know when i get back from the from the tour i'll get back to doing some more writing and uh uh hopefully generate the the, the next level of the album you know and um you know in a way this this the song you know since 2017 is really two songs you know which is one is since 2017 one is um uh, matches from the you know take We've come to take the matches from the child, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'll sort all that when it comes to the album, you know. And uh, I, I like with the album that you can develop these ideas and sort of have the songs, you know, played. And then later on, you might sort of reference them again. And depends whether I want to sort of turn it more into a sort of concept album. Um, I, I working on, you know, having done this subject, I'll turn to another subject. And I, I like always to be doing different contrasting things, you know. Right, right. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, I can't wait for it. Uh, and thank you for releasing it. <laughs> um, you are in a hotel room right now, you're on tour as part mm -hmm. of a, an 80s package. Um, yep. you, you know, all of these bands, Belinda Carlisle, uh, General Public, Full of Seagulls, Missing Persons, you're playing with a lot of these different bands. Um, do you enjoy stepping back to that time? of performing that era of your music. Yeah. Okay. I do. Hard not to enjoy <laughs> playing a song to three, four thousand people that the Greeks say, or, or any of the other gigs. You know, we did a gig down in Anaheim, which was really great audience attendance and a great crowd, you know. We've been playing in Texas. Uh we played Denver as well. Um it it's hard not to enjoy, you know, getting this really great response from a crowd, you know. And um, I think um, you know it's very easy to sort of think of music as a sort of, um, as Stephen Pinker put it, you know, oral cheesecake. <laughs> uh, there you go. That's perfect. I love it. <laughs> yeah, you probably shouldn't have it, but, you know, it's kind of fun. Um, uh, it isn't that. You know, it's something much more fundamental. And, and I've been struck. Um, a friend of ours made us these sort of tags with Wang Chung on them, you know, like luggage tags, you know, and oh, I have yeah. one on guitar case and a couple of people have come up to me at airports i think they notice the tag look at me and think oh it's him you know and very respectfully they say i just want to thank you for the music you know it got me through a very difficult time in my life you know oh. and you, that that's important you know the, the sort of contribution to be able to make to, to be able to give people that you know you don't think about it at all when you're sitting in some you know basement flat <laughs> in <Right>. london <laughs> you're trying to write a song trying to get on the ladder of the business do you know what i mean you know but um but it's but it's you, you you are you know you are picking up a sort of energy that you're generating through the song and and that energy goes to people as well and they you know mu music's a fascinating thing you know when, when you talk about uaps and all that stuff right. and and the uh, and the ideas the, the the larger ideas that come out of it sort of thing you know um mu music is kind of to me has always been you know, there's a friend of mine who's a neuroscientist, you know, without getting too deep into this. You know, right. And great conversation. You know, he's he's very scientific in his viewpoint. And his viewpoint is that everything that happens, happens in your mind, you know, and that you're kind of a, a fairly isolated organism just coping. <laughs> your brain's just coping with all this input, you know. Right. Uh, I sort of argue with him, you know, but when you play music, when you're, especially when you're in a large crowd of people, you know, you are connected to them, you know. And I sometimes have this feeling of like coming out of my body and going to this other level where everybody, that's where they actually are <laughs> on this other level. I mean, and, and when you're at that level, you can really kind of hit, you're, you're in touch with people. Do you know what I mean? If you stay yeah. down here, then, then yes, you're on stage playing and they're listening, sort of thing. But there is another level to it, you know. And um, 
uh, and we have interesting conversations around that. I've yet to convince him that um, he, he's wrong about everything's just in the mind. <laughs> 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 you know, and, and you know that is there's so much truth to to all of that really um you know it, there is a an ethereal kind of uplifting sense of as a fan uh mm. where you know i'm no longer at the show we're in a space uh, and, mm. and I've, I've i've felt that um you know that is a special special thing yeah. i've felt that listening to music um where you you go to a space, uh, yeah. you, you know, there is, it's, there's, there's good music, there's great music. And then there's that music, uh, yeah. that, you know, takes you somewhere you've never been. Um, mm. it's a, more of a feeling than anything else. Uh, mm. and you know, you have done that for so many people, um, that's, you know, with, with your music, um, like I say, it is part of life as we know it, um, for so many people and for for you know that audience to go back and hear that music and and be with that music and be with you creating it uh is a special thing uh you know that especially that 80s stuff we we all love that as as fans for sure mm. it's an interesting time. yeah and i think as well i think back to the show at the greek and we played to live and die in la on on that show and I think when we play that song here in LA, it's quite an emotional experience for people, you know, because the song is quite sort of, um, it asks, you know, a big question about why do we <laughs> live here? You know, we're, yeah. I mean, I love Los Angeles. It's utterly beautiful. I really get why people live here, you know, but at a, at a deeper level, you know, when, with all the, when life's tough, you know, you ask that question. Mm -hmm. uh, touching because, um, you know, William Freakin, who we made the movie and we did the soundtrack for, he passed away about two weeks ago, I think, maybe maybe three, you know. Yeah. So I, I sort of just talk about him a little bit and, and dedicate the performance to him, you know. And and again, people get get that, you know. There's because um, with the eighty stuff, you know, a lot of it is kind of party party, and and that's yeah. great that there, you know. But to have that little thoughtful moment uh, in a set, uh, I, I think is really cool. People dig that. Yes. You know? Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> and I and I love. I, you know, I have, there's a special place in my heart for that movie because mm. of that music. Uh, mm. I really equate the two, um, and I've heard you talk about it. And Friedkin modeled the movie after the music, which is really he the pacing of the movie and everything went with what you had already written, which is really unique. I think mm. uh, is that something that you would try again because i know like i i i hear like tarantino especially his mute the music in his movies becomes iconic because yeah. it is one with the scene uh would you be interested in doing something like that again yeah i was talking to a friend of mine yesterday who's a you know real movie buff uh, craig mcneil and uh talking to him about the guardian which is the, the second movie that i did for bill Mm -hmm. uh, that movie, I I scored to picture. I was in a studio here in LA. He would right. send me brushes over. We'd have it up on the screen, and I'd try and you know work my ideas around the stuff and pace it, you know. And I basically said to Craig, "What a waste of time <laughs> that was, basically, because in the end, Billy used the music in all sorts of different places anyway, which is you know, what directors do, you know. Um, but I must say, even when you've got a really you know properly skilled uh, music score person. Uh, you know, Howard Shaw or John Williams or whatever. You know, I, I must say, when the music is like underscoring the emotions of the film, it it really makes me feel a bit nauseous. <laughs> actually, yeah. you know, like I get the the emotion from the acting if it's any good. Do you know what I mean? And I don't need music right. to feel or make me want to cry or whatever. Do you know what I mean? Right. <laughs> It's there for something else, you know. And I think Billy Freaking really understood that in all his movies, you know. Um, I, I once wrote a, a sort of essay thing for this Italian film festival where they were doing a retrospective of all his films. And uh, and I wrote about the music in The French Connection and The Exorcist and, and how he uses music like another character, really. You know, when the music's playing, there's a different person in the room kind of shining light on, on stuff, if you like, you know. Uh, and quite often the music's not playing. <laughs> this yeah. kind of dialogue. And, and that silence around the dialogue can be just as 
uh, you know, effective. And uh, and I find today's movies and music, I sound like such an old guy, you know, but but when the music's playing all the time, it just drives me nuts. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, question, would I want to do it? I, I'd be quite interested in working with a director who was wanted to use some, you know, I'll write some music, he'll put it in the film because he likes the atmospheres that I generate out of the music. But do I want to sit in a, a sound studio, you know, trying to write some cello melody to somebody weeping? No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> that makes perfect sense to me. Uh, you know, and I, and I see so many films, like uh, a Tarantino film, I hear Stuck in the Middle with You, and and I think, of, you know, I knew that song before the, the, the movie, um you know reservoir dogs but now when i hear it i think about that scene uh yeah. you know and the breakfast club um yeah. you know that has a lot of that uh which you were involved with uh, as well yeah. um yeah. is there I, I think to myself if i had written that song um do i want it to be associated with a particular scene in a movie it's kind of like a commercial you know do you want somebody to hear your song and think of you know cornflakes <laughs> you know uh not necessarily uh no. does it work the same in a movie like if somebody hears your song and thinks of that can't think of anything but that movie is that something that would bother you i mean yes and no i mean it's the mtv conundrum in a sense isn't it you know right. it's being in the really early days of MTV, you know, for me, a video for a song, in a sense, took some of the imaginative fun out of the old way of listening to a song purely as music, you know, where your own imagination would generate the the imagery or the, the stuff, you know. So I'm, when I complain about MTV, I always feel like I'm sort of biting the hand that <laughs> was so good for Wang Chung, you know, and, it, and sort of got us into everybody's consciousness you know um so it, it was a great marketing tool uh incredible marketing tool you know but um but yeah i mean when you talk about tarantino and the way he uses music i remember the first conversation i had with billy was you know he said i don't want music to underscore the film i want it to juxtapose into the film you know so the music kind of like in a sense contradicts the, the and it, that is exactly what's stuck in the middle with you do you know what i mean right Does, as well dogs you know it's a really bland song frankly you know what i mean <laughs> right in that tense situation it counterpoints the the thing you know uh, I, I, uh the scene I, i've seen uh a movie i forget which movie it was but someone basically about to get beaten up with a baseball bat or something something horrendous and right. dance all day playing in the background <laughs> and, kind of queasy you know but I, I get that it's a very effective use of the song in a sense because dance all days is you know represent everything that that scene isn't about you know and right. um uh, so so yeah so to answer your question you know if people are kind of as it were get the two things on, on the same page of their memory uh yeah i guess that's just what happens do you know what i mean and uh, and, uh, and it's kind of cool yeah yeah sometimes it can be very cool uh you know i don't mind uh you know stuck in the middle with you and and that scene uh yeah. it's it because it makes sense it, it's you know it is very well used um taser up uh 2012 mm. uh, first full-length record in 23 years uh yeah. that was um now it's been 11 years uh yeah. <laughs> and i have to ask right um you know, what's the working relationship with Nick? Um, will we get another Wang Chung record? Yeah, Nick and I get along great, you know, and um, I, I think we've sort of evolved into different people from in, inevitably different people from who we were in the 80s. You know, I know Nick has written quite a lot of songs and, um, you know, he's got them you know, ready to go. Uh, I'm working on my stuff, which tends to come in this, you know, like if I'd released since 2017, uh, as a Wang Chung song, I, I don't think that would kind of work somehow. It's not right. a Wang Chung. You know? Right. Wang Chung is a certain animal, if you like, that um, we need to feed uh, with, with songs. The metaphor is not great, is it? Um, but um, like but yeah, the short answer to your question is, yeah, we are definitely in, in the space to do some more work together and create a new Wang Chung album. But that's not in the immediate future, I don't think. Uh, okay. The immediate future is going to be uh, finally getting the reissues of our old albums uh, into the marketplace. You know, this is something it, Wang Chung fans have known about for five or six years, you know, that we're intending to do this. 
uh, all sorts of things have come up and intervened, not least the pandemic, you know, which uh, meant it was very hard to get people to go to the tape vault in, you know, Universal and <laughs> find stuff for us, you know. Yeah. Uh, but we have like found a, a lot of stuff, you know, so the original albums, but also the demos for those albums and uh, all sorts of other outtakes and songs that we recorded at the time but didn't use and stuff, you know. So, um, so the plan is to uh, to issue those albums in sort of deluxe editions uh, throughout next year and probably the year after, you know. And I think during that time, Nick and I will work on new material uh, and get, and get something else as, as a sort of concluding little fanfare to the whole thing, you know. Man, that is uh, that's great news. It's really great news. I love that. That you know, we're looking at a year uh, to to get those reissues somewhere around there. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, awesome. And in place, and I think a company that's going to support us, and that's kind of, in a sense, been the difficult thing. You know, how do you, how, do you, you know, is it well? What, what's the point of making a three CD box set of points on the curve? You know, um, what to do with it? Basically, you know, there there aren't any shops to put it in. Really, you know, the, you know, um, right? Are you selling it online? So, how do you make people aware of it? You know, some. It's, you know, on the one hand, you sort of think, well, it's great, the online thing, because, you know, but again, you, you've got to be able to target people. You know? So um, you have to use the sort of modern techniques plus the old retail techniques and getting a blend of the two. And I think we found a company now who, who are modern enough to be able to embrace those two things, you know. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Well, we look forward to it for sure. Uh, you know, and I, I can't let a conversation with you go without asking about the anatomy lesson uh <laughs> you know we here we go again right yeah uh, are we any, any closer to hearing that <laughs> uh i not know that that i haven't really sort of thought about you know someone <laughs> asked on this tour you know um yeah i don't know whether it's because it's a sort of rather painful experience the whole thing that i kind of can't quite look at it square in the face you know but 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 it's there you know uh it will come out at some point, and I guess within the context of reissuing the the other albums, it will be uh, sensible to to make that uh, another reissue. You know? Yeah, that's uh, it. it it's never been you know issued, so <laughs> yeah, right. right. Uh, it keeps us chomping at the bit, if you will. We'll, you know, we'll you know, we are paying attention. Uh, <laughs> um, right. Have you ever considered writing all your stories down, writing all your experiences uh, in a book? Yeah, yeah. That's something I've thought about for quite a while. Um, I, I sort of, a New Year's resolution was to, to make a start on that, you know, and I, I haven't done it this year, you know. But uh, that, that is my intention, is to try and, yeah, convey uh, some of what I've been through in, in my life, you know, which I, I really get is is not just my life and what it's done it's it's what i've lived through you know it's this era era that we've lived through you know, era um and and you know it more than anybody do you know what i mean how music was the sort of cutting edge if you like of yep. uh <clears throat> your sort of cultural awareness you know the the music was the first thing and you, maybe you didn't get into literature and movies and stuff but music was like the arrowhead you know and a new song was a incredible way to kind of get a whole new sense of like wow this is you know a whole new way of listening or looking at music you know right and and i, I want to try and sort of convey that to a, a a younger audience in a sense who are growing up in a world where music is one of a number of different forms of entertainment you know and try and get that place where actually you know music isn't entertainment <laughs> it's something bigger than that you know people laugh at me when i'm talking like this you know because i i used to say to my kids you know it's not fun playing music it's not about fun you know and they just i think i was and I sort of was, you know, but uh, there there is a side to it, I think, where it's sort of like, um, <clears throat> yeah, you need to sort of think about what it is as a as a cultural manifestation. And as I say, it's you know, for some people, it's very important, you know, like they go through periods in their lives when they need it. And maybe during the pandemic, when a lot of people were routinely saying, you know, without, you know, music, I wouldn't have got through that time. You know, it, it's it, that to me says music is something very fundamental and uh there's all sorts of ways of looking at that, you know, that music's been part of human societies since you can possibly begin to see the evidence for human societies, you know. So it it's really is part of us. And uh, and this phase that we've lived through where music's like, you know, the technology, as it were, has enabled music to be like just there in your living room, you know, for us buying the, the vinyl and stuff right. initially. 
but now at the touch of a click of a button on your phone you know you've got the world's music at your fingertips you know yeah. and that's incredible but also makes it maybe feel like a little uh, how do you value it when it's like that you know? right right and that's that is perfect way of, of putting that because yeah i mean i appreciate it as an older person that mm -hmm. you know we didn't get this so you know i can pull it up and it's exciting to me to be able to to do that well the, the kids really don't know any different uh mm -hmm. they don't know that it was an event to go out and buy a record and unwrap it and smell it and put it down and hear that drop and spend yeah. the day with it uh that was a, a thing yeah. uh you know now they just click on it they click off of it and they're on to the next one and there's the value seems lesser uh you know but i don't but know i have to say that you know, some of these gifts you've done there's some very young people who come stand in line and get an autograph from me and nick on the albums and you know they've discovered wang chung and they're really into it you know and uh so again this, uh, you know, is this that's tremendously valuable in itself, you know. <clears throat> but it's just that I guess how music's spoken about, you know, and where it is exists in education and so on, you know, it's kind of mm -hmm. too much. Or certainly in the UK, I don't know what it's like in the US, but in the UK, you know, there's almost a sense of like, well, forget teaching music at school, you know, it's it's like um, all cheesecake, you know. And I think that's really missing the point. Music is an incredible thing to learn at school, not because you get good on your instrument, but because you get used to sitting with people and making music and dealing yeah. with people great and dealing with other people who are much better than you and, and all of that stuff. It's, it's incredible for you. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, it teaches you that, that socially and, and patience, I think, too. And, you know, and focuses your mind for more than yep. three <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly exactly jack this has been wonderful it always is i'm so glad when you visit um are we gonna see you on tour by yourself will we see another sort of section of touring for you after the the 80s package i would love to do that yeah i mean i think next year is going to be another wang chung year you know because of the reissues and so on right. and there's do a different sort of touring if possible you know um during that time, I, th I think we'll certainly do some of the Lost 80s stuff. I know that Rob, who runs the tour, you know, he changes his mind all the time, but he's thinking about slimming it down somewhat, you know. And um, and we haven't been to the East Coast for quite a while, actually. You know? So I'd like to do some work on the East Coast, and that will involve a slightly different sort of touring structure. But hopefully there'll be slightly longer Wang Chung sets and deeper cuts and, you know, uh, all of that stuff so next year wang chung but i would absolutely love to come over here and play some of the solo stuff and um yeah, yeah american audiences would really get it yep yep definitely jack thank you so much uh always a pleasure uh let's do it again thank you scott i've enjoyed it a lot all right take care yeah bye-bye bye-bye